different concepts for the current environment. Uh, as Kyle said, my name is Tristan Peterson, a Northeast marketing agent for crop growers, specializing in the Dairy Revenue Protection Program. As we begin, I would just like to take a moment to thank Crop Growers and Farm Credit East for hosting this event for us today. I also want to take a moment to thank all of you, our attendees, for participating in this important and timely risk management discussion. Today we have with us both Dr. Maren Bozik from the University of Minnesota and Greg McConnell, a business consultant here with us at Farm Credit East out of the Geneva office. Uh, Dr. Bozik, in, in, excuse me, is an assistant professor with the department Department of Applied Economics at the University of Minnesota. Marin's research program in dairy economics covers dairy, dairy policy, risk management, demand for dairy foods, and economics of new dairy food processing technology. Since earning his PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2011, he has published a dozen research articles, has served as principal investigator on over 20 fun, funded projects. Dr. Bozik serves in a leadership role in several organizations. He's an associate director of Midwest Dairy Foods Research Center and the facilitator of Minnesota's Dairy Growth Alliance. Marin is also a member of the National Program on Dairy Markets and Policy. We also have with us today, Greg McConnell. Greg brings an extraordinary depth of experience and knowledge to his work as a business consultant. Greg began with his professional career as a regional sales rep for an Ithaca-based cooperative then, as a farm credit loan officer, he worked with a diverse portfolio of businesses for 15 plus years, including dairy, crop, equine, and wineries. Greg's prior career in the dairy industry has now been redeployed heavily in the dairy farms in the Western Finger Lakes region of New York. He provides dairy benchmarking and peer comparison services, as well as detailed managerial accounting for dairy farms, including monthly budgeting, financial progress compared to the budgets, and risk management advice. As Kyle mentioned, we have a lot of time at the end of this presentation for any questions. So feel free to text chat those in as we go through. Uh, and with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Bozik so he can start his presentation. Good morning, everyone. I'll turn on camera just for a brief moment um, here to uh, introduce myself. Um, thank you, Tristan. Uh, thank you. Uh, it, it's a privilege to be in the same webinar with Greg, who's a wealth of knowledge. Um, and it's a privilege to serve the Northeast. I know the times are tough, uh, and I hope that everybody on this webinar is at least uh, healthy and that your families are healthy as well. Um, to preserve the bad. No, nope. wrong screen. Okay. Marin. All right, there you go. Yeah, I, I thought it would be the appropriate slide to, to start, unfortunately. Um, so we are now living in times of black swan. Uh, my kid, my 13 year old asked me uh, the other night, says, uh, dad, what's a black swan? I said, well, you know, that's something that comes very rarely and it's, it's really bad and it hurts everyone a lot. And then he said, and does it have Natalie Portman? So, uh, you know, what that illustrates is that black swan is never what you expect it to be. And it usually doesn't have Natalie Portman. It's, it's, it's bad, it's rare, and, and we are seeing it right now with COVID-19. Um, this is a time of tremendous struggle, but also tremendous opportunity. The, this is Dow Jones index in, through March, some of the biggest one day drops in the history of the stock, stock market have been um, recorded during that time, and also some of the biggest gains, day-to-day -day changes, and uh, were also some of the biggest day-to-day -day positive changes recorded back then. We are learning again to live with shortages. It started off with a toilet paper, uh, and now it's probably going to move into meat, um, as, as, a condition, as work conditions in meat plants require that workers work close next to each other as they um, process the animal, as they harvest the animal. It's a, it's a fertile ground for, for the virus, unfortunately, and also carpooling to the plant doesn't help either. Um, so we are seeing now probably 15, 20% of US meat capa processing capacity is, is, uh, has been affected. And uh, coming um, soon to the grocery store near, uh, near you, probably some rationing in the, in the, in the meat aisle. 
also with uh, with the quarantine and shelter in place the the fam family dynamics are quite interesting some people are rediscovering love for their family and reconnecting with their spouses and playing with their kids um well there, there's this meme here on the right side indicates that there, are, there may be some other outcomes as well so so we all look forward to uh um it, it's great to spend time with families but it's also great to be able to earn your income and and have a social life as well and we hope that the economy will reopen soon uh, at least gradually um, what's going on right now we we are looking at we are staring at the beginning of a major recession um, my favorite graphic not for the result but just the the uh, persu persuasiveness of expression the new york times uh, front page from a few weeks ago you can see the let me see if i can uh, you can see the historical weekly unemployment claims going back decades and then when, when we locked down the economy this is what happened and and now we have three four weeks of these really really high bars with over 30 million americans now out of work or furloughed when we had 2009 what what we called then the great recession it was recession here it was just a slower growth in china and, and other developing countries um, but now even even that that part of the world is forecasted to have negative growth at least for part of this year and we will see what happens in 2021 of course everybody wants to be optimistic but a lot will depend on how quickly we can ramp up testing how quickly we can ramp up the production of vaccines um, and uh, and I, I wish I, I wish I could tell you that things are going to be okay uh, within three or four months, but that would be a lie. You know, th this is uh, nobody knows for sure. But you know, we we have to be prepared uh, to endure a longer crisis. Unfortunately, um, we, we are having some background noise with someone there. Krishna, would you be able to mute everyone except me? Okay, I'm going to continue. Um, so uh, the COVID-19 had dual impact, impact on dairy markets. Retail sales are up. At first they were considerably up, dramatically even, and then they stabilized, but they stabilized at a higher level. In particular, butter is going really well in retail because you use butter for cooking at home. Um, fluid milk went up dramatically at first now it's still in positive territory year over year but not nearly as much as we've seen in the first two weeks when folks thought that they'll need to freeze milk um that we are going to be completely out of it which turned out to be an uh, inaccurate assumption unfortunately um, half of our cheese half of our butter is consumed in uh, through meals purchased out of home through food service restaurants fast foods etc and uh, those sales are down 70 percent uh, restaurants in particular are mostly closed uh, we just here the other day my wife sent me to uh, do some pickup from from one of our favorite restaurants you had to order online that i drove there you call them from your phone once you're in front of the restaurant you open your truck and then they come you know and put your food in the in the trunk and and close it you know i, I felt like i was picking up drugs not food it felt like a some sort of like undercover deal um, that just tells you that you know it, it's going to take a while before people feel comfortable going back to restaurants and enjoy the company of their friends which then means of course that cheese and butter and, the, and whipped cream that were consumed through restaurants will not will not uh, be consumed that way for uh, while this is going on um, in minnesota we, we started reopening the economy uh, manufacturing and uh, office workers were allowed to resume work last week. That's going to expand probably next week, probably to home workers and others. But the very last group that will be allowed to reopen will be restaurants. Restaurants get open when everything else is working, where restaurants and, and um, sports venues, when everything else is working well. So, so it's going to be a while before, um, before we return to normalcy there. Um, the statistics here, on where our domestic sales were before COVID-19 and you can see that the fluid milk 
about two thirds were in retail, but cheese and butter, as I said, about half half between food service and retail, and and that's that's where the problem is. Um, the exports will we we still we are still waiting for numbers for for March and April numbers won't be available until a few months later. Um, however, we we do see a slowdown uh, overall um, uh, across. In aggregate, we, we see a slowdown in our exports, and that's also pressing on our price. As so, uh, I have limited understanding of our current dilemmas on the ground. Do you have ideas of how best to? Is somebody asking me a question or trying to multitask while the webinar is going on? I, I'm hearing some conversations. Okay, let's just assume that was unintended. Um, so this is from our tool. Uh, that the tool that you have access through crop growers, if if crop growers is helping you with your risk management with dairy revenue protection, and and this is this was done uh, on April 15th, so so two weeks ago, um, and it, it illustrates the magnitude of decline in class three and class four prices um, for April June 2020. And you can see that we went from a high of seven, almost 18 bucks for class three in the first part of the year, January 24th, we were 17.88. I remember that week I was in, in, in Wisconsin, Madison. I gave a, a, a keynote at the Dairy Strong Conference, which is one of their biggest conferences of the year. I said, 2020 is going to be a great year, a year to recover your equity that you lost over the last few years, to rebuild your strength for future. Uh, challenges in this decade. Well, that didn't age well, did it? Um, and, and at that time, we still uh, had some news about problems uh, in China, but nobody really expected it to be as dramatic as, as we are seeing now. Um, some good news on the price, if uh, if you want to call them that way, um, is that this is class three price, and you can see that we seem to have turned the corner here in the last week. We were uh, expected price for April June was 11.66. We are now uh, over 12 bucks, 12.45. So almost 80 cents up, almost a dollar up. And um, haven't looked at class four, uh, but no, that one is not. That I guess the the bleeding stopped, but it, it's not showing signs of recovery yet. So in fact, yes, we've been we are 10.70. That's that's darn low. That's really ridiculously low. Um, so going back to my slides. So what to do in a situation like this? Um, what we are seeing around the country are cooperatives and processors implementing various forms of two-tier pricing. Uh, some of them that had those programs for a number of years now are making their base even tradable. Uh, others are just now implementing emergency programs. Um, a lot of them kick in May 1. So basically tomorrow we'll see um, how we react to this. Um, a lot of them are calling for 10, sometimes 15% reduction in milk production. So if that happens, if we see a lot of milk affected by these programs, that is going to uh, lift the prices. I, I think at this point there is some uncertainty regarding the amount of milk that, be, that will be affected by the uh, cooperative-led um, supply management programs. And I think that one of the long-term learning lessons from COVID-19 crisis will be the the need to um, manage the supply of milk at the at the buyer's level more closely rather than allowing people to grow as they please. Um, that social contract that was in place until maybe five years ago, that cooperative is there to buy all the milk you produce, uh, that's that's that. You know, going forward, there'll be a different situation. And and perhaps um, some of the f emphasis on efficiency will be uh, traded off in favor of robustness. Do we have enough capacity in place and do we have enough agility to react to adverse effects? Um, as far as the dairy policy goes, um, there, there has been a, a very robust debate, and I certainly do uh, praise those uh, that, that have been creating different programs for their creativity and, and their good intentions to help producers. Uh, National Milk and IDFA 
uh, came with the comprehensive milk crisis plan, uh, elements of which have been accepted by USDA, in particular the uh, food purchases will start shortly um, and there will be some direct payments. Uh, however, USDA refused to implement the supply management program um, and, and I, I don't think it's realistic that, to expect that they will change their mind. Um, they, they, they face numerous challenges within the administration with just executing these programs and the more you add to complexity, the more, um, uh, the more difficult it is for them to, to implement it. So what we will see happen is a program called Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. It will be in the form of direct payments. It will be announced next week. The details will be announced next week. Um, the overview of the program has been announced, I, I think, a week and a half ago. Uh, what we are likely to see happen are payment limitations per farm that will be larger than what Secretary Perdue um, uh, publicly stated uh, a, few, a few days ago. Um, so in the initial announcement, it was $125,000 per entity per commodity. So if you have an LLC, uh, and then for your dairy business within that LLC, the limit would be $125,000. They're likely to double that at least, um, and they may introduce some leeway for for S corps or LLC, so that you know if you if you are a sole proprietorship, you can claim yourself and your spouse as too actively engaged in farming person so effectively double the payment limitation uh, they may they may introduce something like that for llc's you know, uh, nobody knows for sure but that's the latest word on the uh, on the street regarding what's going to come out this week um, overall the size of the dairy package will be uh, 2.9 billion for direct payments and then um, another uh, maybe close to a billion in in uh, purchases you know uh, they they said that, that they'll do it at a pace of 100 million dollars a month uh we'll see if that uh, if they succeed in that or if they'll have to make changes there so um there are two main messages that i would have for you uh in terms of risk management right now um and the the first is that we have dairy safety net that is second to none uh, anywhere in the world we have the most comprehensive and the most effective dairy safety net uh, anywhere in the world. They don't have anything like dairy margin coverage or dairy revenue protection in Europe, in Russia, in China, Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, New Zealand, you name it. They don't have it. We are the envy of the world in that respect. Um, the only problem is you got to use it. You know, it. It's not like MILC that, you know, that the money will just come. Well, I guess even there you had to sign up at least. So if you look at the projected indemnities, for calendar year 2020, so this is the fourth quarter of this calendar year, not by reinsurance year. California is at almost quarter million dollars, and they are the top producing state in the nation. Wisconsin, 137. And then when, whenever we look at the list of top producing states, Idaho and New York are very, very close. And one month, New York would be higher. The other month, Idaho would be higher. And look at Idaho and New York when it comes to DRP. Idaho is at 100 million projected indemnities this year, New York only 40% of that. In other words, if we can get New Yorkers to, to at least use DRP as much as Idaho, then in a year like this, we would have $60 million more coming to you guys. Uh, that's non-negligible. And, and even Idaho is, has low utilization and this is gonna, you know, their, their utilization of DRP is probably gonna double in the next year. Um, Pennsylvania, only 13 million. Uh, even, even when you account for some admirable um, self-imposed restrictions on usage of uh, government programs because of religious beliefs, this is still indicating of um, uh, vastly underutilized program uh, in that state. Vermont, you know, four million, that's, that's, that's not sufficient by any measure. So, so we, we need to do better. Uh, DRP is, is there for you. Um, of course, you are. If you haven't used it before, you are too late for the crisis that's happening right now in this quarter, and and perhaps to, to the most for the most part Q3 of 2020. But you know now is the time to start thinking about 2021. Um, and CFAP payments are going to be of huge help uh, this this summer. Um, another point that is critical to understand here, I guess a related point, is that when you look at a percent of milk covered 
from DRP and DMC together, um, we have Wisconsin half of over half of the milk, Minnesota almost three quarters of the milk, Idaho almost forty percent, Texas is at almost half of the milk, New York nineteen percent, Pennsylvania twenty two percent, Vermont is in barely in, in the double digits there. Um, but because we have now nationwide almost 40% of milk covered through some form of risk management, any attempts from Washington to provide um, either bailouts through risk management, for example, reopening their margin coverage or selective bailouts in form of uh, this most recent proposal to, to uh, modify federal milk marketing orders, that's dead on arrival. That's not going to happen going forward. You have in sufficient critical mass between administration, Congress, and dairy community that are saying no pasaran, like this will not go forward anymore. We, we now have, if, if only 5% of dairy hedged, then the other 95% would come together and a crisis like this would get a bailout. When you have 40% of the milk hedged, those that have hedged, are saying, what am I, stupid? Why did I do it? I know it hurts you guys now, those that, that haven't done something. And I, I know, I, you know, I, and I get uh, on my phone, I get, you know, their farmers sending me pictures of their kids, you know, and telling me how important it is that their ERP performs really well this summer because they've banked their entire you know, well being of their family on it. And I know that, you know, others are struggling mightily on this. So CFAP is going to, to be a help for everyone this summer. But going forward, you really, really got to take the personal responsibility in your hands to, to manage risk. Those that don't do that just won't be around uh, for, for many more years. That's, that's, the, that's the reality that we are living in. So what to do now, you know, given where prices are, given what decisions you have or have not made before, what to do now? Well, first of all, um, coronavirus food assistance program is going to be generous help, very generous help. Um, I'm not, not quite sure which formula they will use in the end, but um, some of my calculations indicate that, that we could be expecting, uh, well, uh, over $100,000 or somewhere there about, you know, uh, for, for, a, for a farm. It, it really depends on which formula they use, but you know, on a farm that, that's DMC eligible, you know, it, it's going to be quite a bit. Um, and um, I, I don't want to give you concrete expectations because they, you may, I don't want you to bank on it before the rules are out. You know, the rules may be subject to change at the last moment, but it's going to be very generous. It's going to make a substantial difference. Um, and that's going to cover a short term. But now is the time to start thinking about 2021. So Greg is going to be more detailed than me. I just want to um, put, a bug in your ear for one fundamental idea. And this is really should be the cornerstone of your risk management. And that is minimize regret. What do you mean, Bozik, like minimize regret? Should I, shouldn't I be minimizing losses on my farms or maximizing profits or maximizing subsidy? No, mi minimize regret. What does that mean? What does make you sore about risk management? When you miss a rally, that makes you angry, right? When you miss a chance to, to lock in and then a crisis happens, then you feel, well, I should have done it. Um, if you lock in a price that's too low and then the prices go up, well, then you feel silly. Then you say, well, I pulled the trigger too soon. So think of all the things that you could do that make you feel uncomfortable or just bad inside later, and then minimize that feeling, minimize regret. How do you do that? Well, here's one template that you can uh, fine tune and customize for your circumstances. So this is not this is not gospel. This is just you know a food for thought. Okay. So um, how about this? Every two weeks, you you call Tristan or or his colleagues or Greg, and you say, oh, hey, what what are the prices doing right now? Or you look at the tool. You can do it on your own in the tool um, that we built for you. So you look at, for example, let's go to the tool now and um, so you look at the, the quarter, this is April 29th, yesterday prices, and you look at, um, okay, where are the, and maybe we can put this uh, in this, or 
So you look at prices for next year and goodness, 1396 revenue guarantee, that doesn't look good to anyone. I know that. But maybe this 1438, you know, maybe if you look at the second quarter of 2021, you don't like it. I know you don't like it. Your cost of production are higher than that or, or you're a genius if you can make milk for less than that much money. Nobody can really that I know. So you don't like the price. What do you do if you don't like the price? Do you just give up? You do nothing? No. What you do is if you don't like the price, you hedge 2%. And if you like the price, you hedge 5%, 5% of what you expect you'll produce um, in the second quarter of 2021. Because you know what? Prices may never recover. We don't know. We may, coronavirus may come back or it may mutate or we may start a war with Russia or, you know, like maybe the Kim Jong-un's sister is even more brutal than him and he really is brain dead right now in North Korea. And, you know, if you think you know what's going to happen in a year, just tell me what your plans were for spring 2020, you know, last spring. So, so you don't know whether $14 will turn out to be a good price or not in retrospect. So if you don't like it, if you really don't like it, just hedge 2% now. And then come back two weeks from now, and if you still don't like the price, hedge another 2%. And if you like the price, well, hedge 5%. If you really like the price, maybe hedge 10%. The point is that you build it over time, whenever there is a rally and you like the price, you lock in a little bit more, so you feel like you're you know, uh, capitalizing on the rallies. But if you don't like the price, you know, and, 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 they, and you consistently don't like it, well, you know, maybe you would um, look back a year from now and say, yeah, you know, I didn't like it back then, but I'm really grateful that I have at least something now. How many of you wish that you hedged $14 plus four um, price for, for Q2 2020? And $14 is ridiculously low already, right? So, so you build this over time, you layer it in, and when you get to about three to four months before the start of the quarter, so that for April, June, 2021, that would be January 1. By January 1 of 2021, you should have 65% um, of what you're going to produce uh, declared covered. I'm using a, a com convoluted phrase on purpose. So declare covered, what does that mean? So that means that if you're going to produce just for the sake of argument, 10 million pounds a quarter, you declare six and a half million, but you use protection factor of 1.5. So your effective pounds covered really are 10 million. So you're fully covered, but you still have a third of the milk to play with. So if we happen to have a rally in that last three months, then you can pull that last trigger, then you can use that last bullet. And, and so that last 35%, um, you use that for opportunistic hedging. So I thought long and hard about this, and, and I know this is not a once and done strategy, but I think that this approach really will minimize your regret. You'll capture all the rallies. Um, you will never feel like, it, like it's a yes, no decision. It becomes on how much decision. Um, you'll make your agents work really hard for the commissions they earn, and as you should, they're earning good commissions. You know, the program is designed in such a way that they, they really want to work with you and educate you and that are never uh, bored by this. Um, and like at the end of the day, last three months, if we happen to have a rally, well, guess what? You still kept your last bullet and you can still capture that $20 milk if, we, if, if something you know, magnificent happens and, and, and there is a short-term dramatic you know, rally on the upside in the last three months. So, so I'm gonna stop here. Um, uh, I'm gonna leave you with this thought. You know, Again, don't read this as gospel, this, these five bullet points here. L read it as a food for thought. How would your risk management strategy look like if you sought to minimize long-term regret of missing an opportunity, missing a good price, missing a rally, leaving premium on the table that you could have used somewhere else? Take that all into, into consideration and see if this is something that you could feel good, even if it doesn't pay out even if it doesn't pay out. And remember, DRP is not gonna pay out every time. It's gonna pay out about 30% of the time and those 30% of the time will be clustered. So for example, in 2020, we may have three or four quarters in a row that are paying out, but then who knows, maybe 2021, two, three, and four will be four years that are really good and it never pays out for four years, who knows? It certainly happened in the past or would have happened in the past. But minimize regret, be disciplined and, and 
I'm, I'm going to stop here. I'll be available for Q&A later, but I think it's time to turn the mic over to, to Greg. Tristan, back to you. Oh, thanks for that, Marin. Um, as we make the transition over to Greg, I just want to remind everyone that we have dedicated some time at the end of the presentation to ask some questions. Um, so if you guys have questions, feel free to text chat those in. And with that, Greg, I will pass it over to you. All right. Well, I'm going to wait for Kyle to push out a uh, screen share uh, because uh, I believe he has my presentation. Uh, just to the group, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for listening to Marin's excellent presentation. I've always enjoyed uh, his presentations, his insight to the government programs, to the markets. What I'm going to talk with you today about more is about uh, applying this on the farm level. Um, and uh, so, yes, yeah, so Kyle's still working on getting my uh, presentation up. Um, hey, you know, Greg, you're our, you should have a button that says, share screen uh how do i share my screen when i don't have the presentation oh oh okay i'm sorry kyle's gonna have to share the his his screen because i'm here at okay. home with no power the wind knocked my power out so just to be clear folks i'm joining you from a a very capable uh um iPhone that's connected to a cell tower and I can see the screen on my iPad. So thank you, Apple, for all of this. Uh, but Kyle's bringing up my presentation and I'm going to have to advance the slides verbally. So here we go. So yes, much more, I'm going to be a much more farm level than, uh, than, than Marin was. And, and I, I appreciate again what Marin did because it gave us the overall layout. Uh, so keep in mind that my business is meeting with farmers daily uh you know it, it, right now through through uh, electronic means and strategizing both how to make a profit and in times like these how to survive a couple one of the tools we use is the the dairy benchmark program success strategies dairy benchmark uh that's a, an excellent program for a deep dive into understanding your business a lot of the ratios that we're going to talk about today flow right out of a program like that so think about consulting as something that you can add to your risk management uh, strategy as well as benchmarking uh, that gives you that sort of clear insight. So if we can advance to the first slide. Um, so what we're going to cover today is, first of all, defining your risk profile. What is your risk profile? Number two, we're going to talk about types of risk management. What's in your toolbox and how to use them? Number three, we're going to finish up with some concepts in milk price risk management. Uh, please turn the slide. So first of all, what is your risk profile? This has nothing to do with your risk appetite. This is based on objective standards like the three at the bottom. And so we're going to look at evaluating your farm from a risk factor perspective. These are objective. They aren't subjective. Um, and then we're going to look at it with two lenses, one with more traditional and one with a little more modern approach. Please turn the slide. Yep. So first of all, a couple definitions. We're going to talk about working capital. It's just a liquidity measure uh, that accountants have used for uh, decades. And it generally is, is uh, a very commonly available number, something that you shouldn't have to work too hard to get. Maybe your lender has it. Maybe your CPA has it. It's basically defined as current assets minus current liabilities. The other thing we're going to see here is break-even milk price. I've seen it defined so many different ways around the country. When we talk about break-even milk price in the Northeast, it's accrual expenses without depreciation expense. Uh, it's this uh, negative sign here is is actually was fixed on my next <laughs> was fixed, but this is the old presentation. It does include family living draws, so you don't take it out; you add it in. So, in other words, if you don't have salaries already up there in your accrual expenses you're going to add in your draws and then here's the key it's going to add in scheduled principal payments so this uh and then fi the final step is subtracting all non-milk income what you end up with is the residual expenses on the farm that have to be covered with your milk price 
And the reason it's so relevant is break-even milk price says, I can cover my debt with X price. Uh, so please advance the slide. So this is our risk profile as defined by our understanding of a very robust data set. If you are on one of these three on the right side, if you're greater than 5,000 debt per cow, less than $500 of working capital per cow, or have a break even over $19, whether you admit it or not, you are a high risk farm. You are definitively high risk by any stretch of the imagination. And therefore, if you aren't using risk management, you really need to learn it and use it. Medium risk, these would be the farms in the middle. Are, if we were looking at a bell curve, we would probably have you know, quite a few farms in the middle, right around 4,000 debt per cow, just under $1,000 of working capital, and so on and so forth, $18 of break even. And you still may want to use risk management uh, at a certain level, but maybe it's not uh, as urgent. Then a low risk farm, clearly if you're less than 3,000 debt per cow and have good working capital, and a break even under $17, probably it's optional, purely optional and something you can use possibly for milk price improvement, but consider it less, uh, less of a sense of urgency. Uh, please, please turn the slide. So if we look at the next layer of definitions, these would be the alternative definitions uh, or risk factors that you could also look at in lieu of the ones I just showed you. So first of all, EBITDA, we're gonna to refer to that, basically just the raw earnings, the raw operating profit of the business before considering interest expense or depreciation. Income taxes and amortization rarely come into the, into the equation, but when they happen, we can uh, eliminate those as well. The way to look at EBITDA is it's the cash, uh, the potential cash throw off of the business, and it directly relates to your ability to afford any debt. Near cash per cow, this was developed by one of our consultants in the Dairy Benchmark Program. Uh, this is a, 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 a very much a specialized ratio. It's designed to capture the ability to take, uh, what, to, to understand how much liquid assets that you have that you can put into play within 30 to 90 days. So we take your cash balance, your deferred milk, uh, at, this is at the end of the year, your prepaid balances, and then here's where it gets really, really funky. We take your available credit. This would be on lines of credit available to be borrowed for any reason, just a phone call away. So that's sort of pseudo liquidity, if you will. And then from this pool of assets, we subtract accounts payable and operating loan balance. The point about near cash is it eliminates the noise that happens naturally in working capital, and it better defines your ability to survive a downturn. And then finally, net cost of production. The best way to explain the difference between net cost of production and break even is net cost of production is using depreciation instead of principal payments. And so where net cost of production comes into things is it uh, basically uh, would be used on a low debt operation that still has, has a fair amount of, of capital assets that need to be maintained for the next generation. So it becomes an alternative ratio where somebody says, hey, I, I wanna make sure I'm covering that. So let's flip the page and look how it all shakes out. And then maybe you can put your farm into this grid as well. So if we look at debt to EBITDA, a lot of times lenders are using debt to EBITDA. Uh, high risk would be greater than seven to one, seven to one ratio of debt to EBITDA. Low risk would be less than three. And this would be based on last year's numbers and, and even on a multi-year basis, you could look at the three-year average would be a common way to do it. Uh, the last five years, it's been very hard to develop a fi uh, five to one ratio, but I would think that's a goal. It's a goal to be at a five to one ratio. Near cash per cow, it's such a harder ratio to achieve that uh, high risk would be less than zero, uh, medium risk is about a, at $400 per cow. And then net cost of production, I will, I'm lowering at 50 cents uh, 100 weight, but very similar to break even. So if we could flip the page. So the takeaway point here is that if you are uh, in one of these categories that you know you're high risk, first of all, 
understand that you're probably hitting on more than one. These factors are connected, highly correlated together. Uh, occasionally you'll find a farm that's high debt per cow that also, but it has good liquidity or a very low break even. That's usually because they've recently bought some assets and they haven't yet had a chance to bring that debt down through good management and good earnings, but they may be fundamentally sound on the other two. So the one I really focus on is liquidity, which would be either near cash per cow or working capital. If that's weak and you have high debt per cow or a really high break even, then we know you're high risk. If you're just high debt, but you happen to be very good on liquidity, you might say, no, I'm not such high risk. And keep in mind, it's sort of a chicken and the egg conversation, but I would say this, that debt almost invariably, not always, but it almost invariably leads to secondary effects on the balance sheet. So if you choose to borrow lots of money and to be a highly indebted farm, that's a choice you made. If you choose to do that, and it leads to the other factors coming in, then I got to ask you a real hard question. Why aren't you risk managing? You chose to, to, to borrow the money, but if you're not willing to put, put uh, risk management into place on milk price, it's kind of like saying, yeah, I'll borrow 6,000 debt per cow, but I'm not going to insure my equipment. I'm not going to insure my cows either. Of course, your lender would require that. And by the way, I'm not going to use life insurance either. And all of a sudden, you're leaving your heirs if something happens to you or leaving your banker, you're right, in the lurch. That's why so many of these insurance products become required. At this point, risk management isn't required, but I got to wonder why you wouldn't do it if you're a high risk farm. So one of the things we found in our most recent benchmark was that about 40% of the farms would qualify as very high risk on at least two of the three factors. So very low working capital and high debt. And so I would venture to say that in the broader uh, you know, uh, industry, looking at all dairy farms, I think it's safe to say that 30 to 40% of farms would be in very high risk and should be aggressively risk managing. So if we can turn the page. So now I'm gonna shift gears, we, we talked about risk profile what's your risk profile and should you does that sort of push you towards becoming involved in risk management so now this is the part about what are the types of risk management management i'm sorry management so before considering these government programs which uh have made uh, a lot of excellent products available to you first of all let's go back to the basics uh, the chicago mercantile exchange has been open for years for decades right and we've been able to forward contract milk or use options. Those, op those, those tools are still in play. Um, you know, certainly forward contracting, we've had a lot of bad experiences with that in the, in the late 90s, uh, mid 90s. People were trying some forward contracting as we got into some milk price volatility. And talk about the regret factor. I'm gonna come back to that slide a few times that Mar Marin talked about. There was a lot of regret with forward contracting. And the one thing we learned with forward contracting was if you miss the peak in the dairy industry, you've probably missed the opportunity to replenish your balance sheet and get through the next downturn. It becomes a very painful exercise to do forward contracting in such a volatile industry where the stakes are so high. And I've often said to my clients, I've said, keep in mind that risk management has risk. And that's a very strange statement, but oftentimes we can use risk management to our disadvantage if we're not careful. So, uh, and sometimes risk management can be very risky. That is, that is an oxymoron, I understand that, but that's how it plays out. So we have to be trained and we have to be cautious how we use these programs. The, the options market on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, uh, you puts calls and fences, all that is to say, you can put a, a floor under your price by paying a premium. You can put a, 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 a ceiling on your price or you can do both and use that, 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 uh, the sale of that call to offset the premium on the put and get a very uh, a low cost risk management and they call that a fence. So in the, let's say in a band between $18 and $15, you just get paid the market price. If it goes below 15, you get paid, uh, you know, you get paid $15. If it goes above 18, you get $18. So, so the, the issue I have with the fence is, again, we can miss the peak. 
uh, but that's that's a very a common tool. So these first two tools, forward contracting and options, are definitely still in play. If you want to use these, you're going to go to a broker's firm. You're going to you're going to have to open a margin account typically, and you're going to have to endure the risk of risk management. So I, I'm just going to state it that way. It's the way I see it. These government subsidized programs have come in lately. These are DMC, LGM, and DRP, and these are what we're going to talk about for the rest of the the presentation. They tend to have first of all lower pre premiums, as well as um, as because they're subsidized, as well as taking more of a, a, a less risky approach to risk management. I know that's still an oxymoron. So let's flip the page. So um, I think we still have someone out there that's unmuted uh, other than myself. Uh, so if somebody could uh, look at that, at muting, muting all. So if we look at these subsidized programs, let's talk about them in theory. First of all, DMC through the USDA, is an income only income over feed cost product based on the NAS data, and you can obtain up to a nine dollar and fifty cent margin. Um, this will uh, this will cost you a little bit of uh, money. We'll talk about costs here again in a minute. Um, looking at LGM, the middle product, this is more or less the same type of product, but it's focused on class three income over theoretical feed cost. And then lastly, DRP is much more flexible and it covers class three or four or a combination, or you can go right out to the components and it's not a margin product. It is just a straight up milk price floor. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a different slide when you guys see this on the internet, if you wanna capture my presentation as a PDF, There'll be an additional slide here and a look at differences in pricing, but I'm just going to verbally talk you through it. The DMC program on the first tier one, five million pounds, is going to cost you either 15 cents or 11 cents if you're at the max level of 950. So if you're if you went for the full five years at 11 cents, that's uh, that's the lowest you can get. If you're on a year by year basis, it's 15 cents for that five million pounds. If you go through LGM, typically we're seeing, we used to see $14 a hundred weight was uh, on a very low, uh, lower risk product. And then we would uh, go up to the mid thirties on LGM. DRP, we used to see as low as eight cents up to about 35 cents. Eight cents would be a close in quarter. Uh, and then we would get up into the mid, you know, the low to mid 20s and then be up in the mid 30s by the time you did a maybe a component contract or something like that. At this time, DMC, seem, or I'm sorry, DRP seems to be running uh, closer to mid 30s. So I think in hindsight, this pricing differential, I, I would have uh, done things, uh, advised some clients differently in 2020, uh, 2020 2021. Uh, we still have a chance to get back into DMC, I think. Bottom line is be aware of the pricing difference. Let's flip the page. So looking at your style, your style of risk management, I think dictates which of these programs you would want to uh, entertain. Uh, if we look at uh, DMC, you enroll once a year. It's once and done. So if you're a farmer that's under 5 million pounds or just over or right around 5 million pounds, and you don't want to be, you know, you don't want to be focused on your phone all the time, wondering what the market's doing. You'd rather drive a tractor or milk a cow. Then I think what we've got to do is we've got to say, hey, this kind of works for me. I can just grab it once a year and I'm done. I've got my risk management done. LGM is going to be the last Friday, business Friday of the month. is the only day of the month you can obtain it uh, for the next uh, you know, opportunities that you have. You can, you can vary the type of uh, a band of months that you want to do but at the end of the day you're going to make your decision uh, after hours on the last business friday of the month some people like this it's a once a month disciplined entry into the risk management market then the final thing for strategy is look at drp again once again it's the most flexible product you have you, but it also can it, you know, if you're the type of person that wants to be constantly engaged with the market, constantly watching it and finding your best deal and having the flexibility to, you know, I, I probably shouldn't even say this word, but even try to time the market, 
uh, good luck with that. But in any case, if you if you're that type of person, then DRT, DRT is your product. Let's flip the page. So as we look at these pr products, keep in mind that LGM and DMC are built on a very similar foundation. It's a milk minus feed equals margin. And both LGM and DMC will likely pay out in 2020, but with, and, and they're both gonna be probably big wins. But with feed dropping at the same time as milk, I would, you know, I would argue that some of the margin, margin program benefits won't be as powerful as just a straight milk price floor would have been. Nevertheless, don't have any regret. They're both gonna be probably strong on payout. Let's flip the page and take a look at how this might work. So if we look at just an isolated month, this would be May's uh, prices for class three and four. And I'm gonna borrow a few graphs here from uh, our friends at Dairy Markets and Policy uh, at the University of Wisconsin. Great website, uh, open to the public, easy to access, easy to understand. A lot of the slides will have pictures coming from them. Uh, but in any case, we can see that if you had locked the price on, let's say, class three, the red line back in January, and then you can see where it dropped to. Now, if you slip, so that should pay out. So if, if you had locked the price in January, uh, let's flip the page. On a margin product, you're also on the bottom side of that, you've got to factor in a margin that was calculated with uh, uh, several different feedstuffs, but look what happened to the price of corn during the same time. So if the price of milk drops and the feed stays the same, you're, you had margin compression. But if the price of milk drops and corn drops at the same pace, which it kind of did, then that margin compression is less, so you get paid less. So that's the main thing is that you understand that sometimes milk and feed move together, and that's where a margin program Sometimes it's good to have that hedge against feed, uh, but it's, again, I, 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 uh, I, sometimes there's unexpected consequences of that, and maybe it's not the exact right product for you. Uh, let's flip the page. I think the main thing with that presentation is to just understand why, how it pays out and how it's happening. So here's another graph that's daily available on the, uh, the Dairy Markets and Policy website. This predicts when the DMC product, which is also a margin product, uh, would pay out. And I captured this as of uh, April 28th, just a couple of days ago. And as you can see, the, the uh, projected payout with the dotted red line, and you can flip the page, is a very similar page, is the dotted uh, dat or the dashed red line going down shows that you're, you're going into the lower decile boundary, which it rarely gets to. Uh, so we're seeing some big payouts on DMC. Now remember, it's two month strips. So the first two months of the year, no payout probably. The next two months, probably a little bit. The, the middle part of the year, those four months in the middle of the year is where most of the payout is on DMC. Now you don't have a choice which, which bands that you get. You get the whole year and you get 5 million pounds broken up into six different bands. So you can see that most of the payout is in the middle of the year, four months in the middle of the year. And at the beginning of the year, no payout. And at the end of the year, as it stands today, we don't know what the future brings, but as it stands today, we basically come right up, right back up to a 950 margin. So this would be for people who selected DMC, paid the premium, and, pay, and bought up as far as you could to 950. If you're at 450 or $5, I mean, you're probably not seeing any payment through this program. Uh, let's flip the page. So if we look at the probabilities, they also have a probability graph similar to the, uh, the website that Marin's team has de developed. The probability is, yeah, you're gonna get paid on tier one milk, which is the red, that's the first 5 million pounds. Uh, I know of very few farms that have used the program to go to tier two above and beyond because the pricing is higher and you might as well go to uh, probably another product like DRP. Bottom line is even if you're at uh, a 650 level, there's a almost 100% probability that you'll get some net benefit after paying the premium. So if we can flip the page. So looking one last thing at the DMC is that it's calculated based on a theoretical ration, a ration that very few cows in this country would actually eat, but it's still representative. 
And the green section shows you alfalfa hay, available again on NASS. And so that NASS website, you can look up what the, uh, the, uh, the, the current surveyed price is for uh, various regions for, for alfalfa. And then, of course, soybean meal and then corn. So if you can flip the page again, we'll see that one of the things is this is a historical look at it, and the corn price has definitely gone down. So the thing I look at this with that I've learned from this is that that eight dollars is roughly where the total ration cost is. So a nine fifty a nine fifty margin floor, just add that nine fifty to eight bucks. It's effectively a seventeen fifty milk price floor, all else being equal. And in your markets, you're probably getting some some hopefully you used to get some some uh, basis premiums and whatnot. So possibly another 50, 50 cents. So maybe an $18 floor is what DMC re really represents. So if you can flip the page. So now let's focus the rest of our conversation on DRP. If we look at DRP, it is probably the most nimble tool. Um, it allows us to access class four where we've had some excellent opportunities over the last 12 to 18 months. Um, and, and although the opportunities right today look like class three, having that ability to turn on the, the focus to class four from time to time is very useful. Uh, let's flip the page. Uh, let's see. Yeah, this is fine. So one of the things to remember is if you're really looking at using DRP, you're pretty much, frankly, betting on a bear market. That things are going to go down and it's a much better uh, uh, strategy to use when times are good so right now times are not good and and i know that marin's pretty pretty strong on let's let's get this thing hedged you know and my, my conversation is if you don't have anything hedged in 2020 it's a tough dollar to spend to add to your uh to add to your you know cost of doing business to do it now when the prices are low but i'm right with marin when it comes to 2021 we really need to be looking at that because we don't know what's going to happen. So the further out you go, uh, maybe it's time to, to take a look at that. Uh, let's go ahead and flip the page here. One of the things I think is wise to do, especially um, when you can time the market, if you're using DRP, you don't have, you're not forced to look at that uh, last Friday of the month or once a year. So basically, if we can look at taking first the higher of class three or four. So to that, that's a very simplistic way of looking at things. It's, it has nothing to do with technical trading. It just says, hey, I'm buying a floor, let's get a higher one. There's not a lot of uh, complicated math in that. So uh, I do think that, you know, I presented to my clients the opportunities in the, in the past 12 months that I saw happening in class four where we could have had an inversion where class four in the past was higher than class three. And I, and I was thinking in my own head and presenting to my clients, I said, if things go south, I don't think they will. Um, turns out I was wrong in that. But that, you know, if, th if things go south, we may have that inversion where class four resumes at the lower amount than class three. So you get a bigger payout. That's exactly what happened. So again, looking to keep the, the floor high, I would go with the higher of, that's how I would. That's how I strategize with my farmers. I'm, I reserve my right to change my opinion on that, but that for now, that's what we're doing. I look for outlier situations. Anytime I see a price that is an outlier price for that class, I, I get a little excited as a possibility of placing a high floor. And generally, I look to place floors well in advance. Why is that? Because there's some awfully smart people trading in the CME, and almost almost none of them are dairy farmers. It's processors, it's other people engaged in the risk, man, you know, in, in the markets, in the CME markets. And since our product in DRP is priced off of these floors and those people are smart, the closer in I get, the more they know and the more, the more I'm struggling to keep up with them. But when we go out five, five quarters, man, I, I don't think anybody knows what's going to happen. And so we can take advantage of that uncertainty and we can also oftentimes that uncertainty builds us a higher floor. Again, very simple strategies. Uh, I do think it's still a valid strategy. If you want to go way, way out in the future, sometimes the first contracts to open are a component contract. I'm not generally in favor of that. I like 
secure uh, endorsements to class three or four. That's where I'm at right now. Again, I reserve my right to change my opinion in the future. But still, there's times where you can get, you know, way out there and the only contract available is component contract. Well, if you want to stay way out there, let's do it. I have no problem with it. Uh, let's flip the page. So one of the things you have to factor in is in all of these products, LGM and DRP, but implicitly in DMC as well, you you have a share of the risk. But even in, in the LGM and DRP, we know exactly what that share is. So an example in LGM is you can select a 50 cent deductible, 50 cent a hundred weight or a dollar. Uh, so, and, and so these deductibles are your share of the downward movement. And the premium will be priced reflective of that risk that you're basically pushing off to the insurance company. Uh, so same thing in DRP, except for we don't express it as a deductible, we express it as a coverage level. So the idea is that the highest coverage level you can select is 95%. And therefore, it, it functions like a deductible, but instead of a hard number like a dollar or 50 cents, it's a percentage. So the way to think about it is if you've locked in, if you're locking in a $15 uh, uh, class three, right? 5% of that is 75 cents. So you would say that's my quote unquote deductible. So you get paid nothing until you clear 75 cents on a $15, uh, $15 floor. And again, premiums are gonna vary if you select a different deductible. So one way to manage your cost could be to change the coverage level. If we can flip the page, that'd be great. So let's look at this in concept. Let's learn from these concepts and how they come into play. If we had locked the price in green on class fours back in January, if we wanted to mimic what that looked like, it'd be about a 90 cent drop to clear our quote unquote deductible, right? That's, that's the risk you bear. So you bared every penny of that 90 cents downward movement. Insurance company doesn't have to pay a dime. If we looked at class three in red, it's a very similar concept, happened to trigger at a different time. Now, if we can flip the page, we'll see how the rest of it plays out in a declining market. Ah, uh, yes, I have in here just a note. That's your deductible on an LGM or your percent coverage if it's DRP. That's, that's the portion I'm sort of showing on the graph. So go ahead and flip the page. So the next slide shows you the effect of if this is your market. And again, I'm just showing one month to be just representative. In DRP, we're looking at strictly three month quarters that have to all sort of be, uh, uh, you do the math on all three to get these numbers. But in essence, what happened on the uh, class fours or what will happen is that they dropped further. They, they reverted to the uh, lesser uh, price. And so the gap became bigger. And if you can just click to the next page, we'll see that that basically boosted our, boosted our payout on class fours bigger than class three. I mean, at this point for a lot of you, like I don't care, anything would help. And certainly a class three uh, or a component contract should pay out under these scenarios. And this is the indemnity part of your, of your, of your product that if you have DRP as your risk management product, uh, I'm not sure if you use the same language in LGM, but in, in essence, this is that what makes you whole. And once you're below that deductible, basically every penny of movement downward is a penny back in your pocket. Now we still haven't talked about clearing the premium yet and that comes up next, if we can flip the page. So uh, this will be now, I'll, I'll cover that in the next section and this section is called using the, you know, basically what are the concepts and what are the strategies in using milk price floors, especially the subsidized floors? Well, first of all, you have two different prongs to this. You can establish a floor that guarantees a, a level of profit or protect the profit or, or, or minimize loss. That's, that's what I would call hedging. In other words, you're not trying to really maximize anything. It's, it, it's like playing defense. It's like saying, hey, man, you know, we're, we're up against like a tough football team. It's all about defense. We're going to win this game with defense. Whereas the orange section, of a marketing tool, this would be your farm that's less than 3,000 debt per cow, has a ton of liquidity, but they might use DRP uh, or LGM anyway, just as a marketing tool. I mean, you, you know, just think about your farm and think about how many things you can control on the milk price. 
And if you pause and think for a minute, it's like, well, I can change my present components. I can work for quality, but otherwise it's not a lot in my control. You know, so I think even for some people that aren't in a high risk profile, they're using these products as a marketing tool. It's more speculative. Let's flip the page. So as we look at that, first of all, we have to tie out either way, whether you're, whether you're more of a, uh, in that speculative group or whether you're in the hedging group, you really need to have these items in your plan. You need to know your net cost of production and or your break even and you need to know your milk price basis. If you don't have those, you probably, you're probably just shooting in the dark a little bit. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It means you're doing it with a little less finesse. If we can flip the page. So our, you know, I'll just flash these definitions up here, but you can, we've already covered the first two. The one at the bottom is, let's take a look at, you know, what is basis? It's very, very, very simple in my, in my book. It's just the difference between your gross milk price, gross milk check price, from a publicly traded product during the same period. Very simple. We talk about PPD and all those things. Actually, go ahead and flip the page. And if we think about what's happening with that is we're getting all lost on basis and all the details. What you really need to know is it's just the difference. It's that simple. And yeah, there's things like PPD that come in and, and they can change, uh, change the, um, sort of change the outcomes. But to me, I wouldn't worry about that. Let's just look at PPD on the average and do the best we can. Yes, it's frustrating. It's frustrating uh, to, to try to anticipate the movement in PPD. I, you know, I've, I've even known some of my clients, some of you might be listening right now, will actually hedge the basis on uh, the PPD on milk. And, and to me, that's, I can't think of anything more risky than applying a PPD hedge on because uh, honestly there's so many moving factors in PPD let's flip the page so I, I like to keep this simple and I like to keep it simple by uh, just focusing on a, a simple basis calculation certainly I like to understand what's underneath it but I, I tend to make I tend to advise my clients to make decisions based on uh, seasonal basis keep it simple um, so one of the things we have, I, I refer to the DRP online tool. That's what Marin had up on the screen. It's an advantage. Any of you who are working with a crop insurance company that's related to farm credit has access to this tool. It's an extremely powerful tool. And that tool does this calculation on the right for you. It does, it's not, you don't even have to work at it as long as you've got your milk checks uploaded uh, into the system. It'll calculate the basis for you and do this math. But the concept is we talked about the deductible, quote unquote, that less. So in this theoretical example, I get a class three expected price of 1670. I take out my 5% of that's the risk that I share. So I got an 84 cent drop, right? That, that's a fairly sizable drop. We got to got to factor that in. And then if I take out a 35 cent premium, uh, that that would be my class floor at that point. I didn't show you that subtotal but then we add back the expected basis to that product or that, that, that class price. And then we get to an actual floor of 1721. Now, if I said to you guys, gee, today, if I could offer you a 1721 floor on your mailbox price, a lot of you'd be saying, yeah, let's go for it. Right. And that's, and that's the concept is knowing what it means to you and your actual milk check. So if we can flip the page. So as we wrap up this conversation, I guess I'd like to present to you, uh, you know, if we were to look at uh, the strategies related to higher risk farms versus farms that may be low risk, but want to use these products to be a little bit speculative and maybe take uh, some control back on their milk price. Uh, first of all, the, if you're in that high risk category, I would advocate for continuous coverage of, of as much milk as you can, especially if you're in a very, very high risk posture, as long as you can protect the level higher than your net cost of production. Now that's a little different message than Marin had. And so you could say we're intellectually sparring here a little bit and that's fine. Because there is no, in my opinion, only being right or wrong, you can only prove in hindsight, right? But I'm still advocating for full coverage 
if you can protect, if you're high risk farm and you can protect higher than your net cost production. And doing this means getting in the market continuously. I wouldn't do it in one day. I'd be 10 or 20% of your milk uh, at a time. If you're, if you're taking it down in 20% chunks, as you think the market is in your favor, that's, that's at least five separate transactions. So think about that. As you get closer and closer to that quarter, like Marin described, you can, uh, you know, you're basically taking down several different transactions. It actually automatically results in a dollar cost averaging, which is a kind of a neat concept. But the idea is continuously being in, trying to cover most of your milk when you can do it at a profit. And you might even cover a portion of your milk at a, at a bit of a loss, but just to protect the amount of that loss. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that as well. If you're on the other side, if you're in more of a farm that's lower to mid-risk, or maybe you're mid-risk on debt, but you have lots of liquidity, you're really not driven to risk management as a, as, a, as a need to save the business, but you might find a way to target certain opportunities. And so you're, you're looking for that outlier situation where that price could be upset in certain circumstances, just like it happened uh, through this event here uh, this year. And so the idea being is, you're looking for that really high floor. In essence, DRP becomes like a marketing tool, just like a crop farmer uses crop insurance. If they use revenue protection in their crop insurance, can be a crop, it can be a marketing tool. Uh, DRP can also function that way. So flip, if you can flip the page, <clears throat> the other way we can layer onto these strategies is um, we can also, and, and this ties right back again to um, Marin's minimize regret a slide. I took a picture of that slide. You know, if we think about what is your strategy, Marin actually advocated for a strategy there. And, I, and it was a pretty cool strategy. It's like, I don't like the price, but I need some coverage. I'm going to do 2%. If I see a price I like, I'll go up to 5%. And that's, that's it for today. That's it for the, for the moment. I'm advocating a little different strategy, anticipating somebody who maybe uh, doesn't want to be in the market every day or every week. But um, so, so strategy number one in the yellow, let's say I'm a high risk farm. Let's say I'm gonna try, if at all possible, to cover most of my milk, 75, 90, maybe 100% of my milk. So let's set up, and to, to keep our emotions at bay, one of the things that, that kills us when it comes to the stock market, uh, these commodity markets, whatnot, even like locking a fixed rate on an interest, uh, interest rate on your loan, those are all risk management or, or investing situations. The emotions are not our friend. So one of the ways you can get the emotions out of it is to write your strategy down and try to stick with it and then reevaluate it every six months to a year. Maybe talk to a consultant like myself. So like this strategy would be, let's evaluate every second Wednesday of the month. Why did I pick that day? I don't know. I just Maybe it works for me. Um, maybe it's when the markets are fairly stable. It's not on a Friday. Um, let's, uh, on that day, if, the floor plus basis exceeds my break even, but I'm sorry, it, it basically that floor is over my break even minus 50 cents. So this is a very protective move. Then I will act. What does that mean? That means I'll do something. I might do 5%. So I, I, I gave myself a target, but then look at my, uh, look at my sort of uh, escape clause here. I will not do over 20% on that given day unless I'm a dollar higher than my break-even milk price. So at a dollar higher, if you want to lock 100% of your milk, I'd say go for it. Now, yeah, you, you're taking a gamble. You're taking a gamble, but at least you're taking some of the emotion out of it saying, hey, I, I set that threshold long before I saw the market, long before I saw the market. And it'll, I'm allowing myself to be aggressive when the market offers me a high floor. Down in the bottom, this strategy would be more for your speculative type of person where they say, all right, well, I'm, first of all, if you go to the bottom bullet point, no matter what happens, I'm not doing more than 50% of my milk. Why would they do that? It's just, this is just a person who's saying, I don't want to spend 35 cents a hundred weight. I don't have to. Why would I do that? So we would limit that. Uh, and ne next, we would say, well, I will not place, uh, I will drive maybe my uh, this person might drive their strategy off the net cost of production. Maybe they're a little lower in debt. Um, and then they would uh, perhaps focus 
on a dollar fifty higher than their net cost of production as their threshold where they would open up the ability to, to lock in more. So if we can flip to the summary slide, I believe is up next, and then we'll open up for questions after that. I'm gonna summarize saying, I believe, number one, that we have, uh, these tools can be used to enhance profit. I think it's a given these tools can be used to enhance survivability, but I think they can also be used to your advantage to enhance profit. But the second bullet point, nobody wins all the time and you can't expect it. Marin said it the same, uh, you know, 30% probability of payout, but that's the reality of it. Um, you know, I think we look, should look at this as another marketing tool, but the bottom bullet point goes right back to risk profile. I believe that we need to have some farms that look at these as essential tools, essential tools for their business because of the risk that they've chosen to carry. And, and, and I think we got to grapple with some of those hard realities. So with that, I'll turn it back to Tristan and we'll have some Q&A. Sorry for taking so long. All right, thanks for that, Greg. Um, let's start with some questions and answers. I know we've had some come through. I'm actually going to pass that over to Chris Lawton with our Knowledge Exchange Group um, for the Q&A section. So Chris, that's all yours. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks very much, Tristan. This is Chris Lawton. I'm Director of Knowledge Exchange here at Farm Credit East, and I'm going to moderate the questions. Um, if you can hold on for just one second, I'm going to, we had a call-in attendee that was making background noise. I'm going to try and mute everyone and then unmute um, myself and yourself, Greg. So hold on one second. Okay, hopefully that will resolve the um, the issue. Greg, can you just say something to make sure you're unmuted? Yeah, I should be unmuted, but uh, make sure you unmute Marin as well if he's still on the line. Yeah, I just did. Um, okay, I'm just trying to unmute. Uh, oh, okay. you, Marin, you need to unmute yourself. Okay, good. Thank you. So we had a few questions here. Um, one for, um, well, could be for both people. Um, question came in, uh, Marin, you talked about the relatively low participation um, in these insurance or, or margin management programs um, in New York State or the Northeast and more generally. Um, what do you think is holding producers in the Northeast back from signing up? Or perhaps put another way, why have why are farmers and dairy farmers in the West and Midwest much more likely to sign up, do you think? Uh, well, I first, I think the MPP uh, sucked big time and, and people got burned and, you know, you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me mentality uh, is a useful heuristic in life in general, but um, DMC is really quite quite a different beast than MPP ever was. Um, so the trick with the DMC is to, to not think about it. Just do it. You know, uh, lock in five years or three years if you can to, to get that 25% discount if it's still available. Lock in 950. Even if you have, you know, 50 cows, 1,000 cows, 10,000 cows, lock in those first 2, 000, uh, 200 cows and set it and forget it. You know, there's there should the more time you spend thinking about it, the more likely you are to make a wrong decision with DMC. So that's the only trick with DMC going forward. Um, why, why did we use uh, DMC more? In Minnesota, we had a state level program that subsidized DMC further if you lock in for five years. So that's, that was called the uh, dairy program with I at the end instead of Y. Um, it, was a it, it was a state it was a state designed program. I helped them a little bit, but I really didn't play any major role there. Kudos to the state legislature. Um, it was introduced in 2019. Um, people signed up for 2019, got some money back for 2019. It was subsidy just enough to basically give you one, one year free uh, in, with DMC. And, and that's why we had such a high participation in Minnesota. This year, if we didn't have that, probably a lot of people would have made a wrong decision and started thinking about the program. Um, you know, so so that, that's part of what, what made a difference uh, there. Um, I, th I think there's also, you know how some developing economies, like some countries in Africa, they can never really develop because they have so many really great natural resources. So they, they, they end up focusing on extracting coal, coal 
or diamonds, et cetera, instead of building the, the knowledge economy. You know, when you have a very powerful congressional delegation, uh, maybe, maybe you start thinking that you know, they're there for you to, to, to help you out after the fact. Uh, Senator Leahy is very powerful. Uh, New York delegation is very powerful in, in, uh, in DC. Um, but that may be a resource course to curse in this, uh, in this uh, setting. Uh, I mean, I'm very grateful to Senator Leahy for, for bumping the maximum coverage on DMC from 9 to 950. That was, uh, that was his doing. Um, but, but he cannot be bailing you out. You got to act now. You know, so um, okay. you know, whatever the reason, reasons have been in the past, 2021 is your year to do the right decision. You know, don't think about it. Just do it. You know, just like Nike shirts. Okay. Just do it. <laughs> uh, Greg, do you have any thoughts about the participation rate in the Northeast? Yeah, I would say that uh, when it comes to DMC, some, uh, you know, and I, I'm partly to blame. I'll say it publicly. I mean, I, I what I was advocating for was I don't, I mean, this looks like a good year. I don't think it'll pay out, but if you're not going to do it, take that $7,500 that you saved and throw it into a DRP product. So in other words, I wasn't advocating not to do anything. I was just saying, if you have a choice, but I think if I could just rewind and in, in life, there's so many times we wish we could rewind, right? If I could rewind, I would have said, just do it, do it all the time, do the five-year deal. Uh, because why? Because really 11 or 15 cents is a nominal premium to pay. I know it's not chump change, but it's still a nominal premium to pay relative to where we are uh, in the market all the time for floors. So I think we, I think we were learning stuff, Marin. I think we're learning. So. Yep. Yep. Yeah. No, the, uh, the MPP really was a program where you had to think twice and, you know, carefully assess year to year with DMC. That's, that's no longer the case. Um, Chris, if, if I could, I would like, love to uh, just share two more tricks uh, with, with LGM and, um, and DRP. Um, uh, on, sure, on go LG, ahead, Mario. On LGM, the trick is not to use it as margin. The trick is to, to use it as milk program as much as you can, because even though it's being promoted as a margin program, the moment you start declaring more corn or soybean meal, the program is vastly overpriced. That program was designed back in 2005. It took them a few years to get to market. Back in the day when they were designing that program, milk and feed were not correlated. So the rating assumptions uh, behind it, the engine behind it, assumed that milk and feed are not correlated, which is not the case, which is a ridiculous assumption, in, you know, which we've seen first in 2009 and then again now in 2020. When milk drops a lot, corn would drop a lot as well because it's usually some macro recession. So it's about 30% overpriced if you really start using it as a margin program. So if you're going to use LGM, declare as little feed as you can. But the trick with DRP, if I could share my screen uh, here um, for a second, I'll be, I'll be very brief, I promise. Um, let me see if I can. Uh, Kyle, do you need to... Uh... I think you may have to Make switch Martin. the presentation to me. Um, well, Martin's, well, Martin's putting that up. I, I agree with this statement 100%. I've been pushing anybody that's using LGM in my portfolio to do just what he said. So I agree with that. Keep going. You, I can see your screen now, Martin. Uh, yeah, I just have multiple. So okay, so here's the cow. You, you should see the tool, right? Uh, now? I do. Uh, I do. Yep. Okay. I can see the yeah. tool. Yeah, so let's take a look at April, June 2021. And I'm going to put butterfat at 3.5 and protein at 3.0. So this is virtually identical to class three. And look at the difference. $16 expected revenue on components, $15.61 on class three. That shouldn't be the case. Those two prices should be exactly the same, maybe a few cents apart because, you know, class three is really 2.9915 protein, not three zero. It's really two points. Um, it's really 5.6935. Other solids, not 5.7. But those are, those are infinitesimal differences. Those are, those are um, non, -sub non substantial differences. But because of the bid ask spread, because of the noise in the market on a day to day basis, sometimes butter, cheese, and dry whey can get ahead of class three just a little bit. So, whereas daily settlement price for class three was 1561, if you were to reconstruct class three price based on these market prices for butter, cheese, and dry whey, you would end up with 1597. 
so you can get a, a revenue guarantee that's what this is uh, uh 20 30 37 cents higher revenue guarantee for six five and a half cents higher premium so that's so when you look at the premium 49 43 keep in mind that you're getting uh that if you if you want to buy class three maybe maybe you're getting you know 50 percent of your milk on class three 50 percent on class four if you for that part that you're covering with class three take a look at what the class three synthetic or 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 implied class three would be with three five butterfat and three zero protein and take a look at the difference between this price and this price the the expected revenue under pure class three versus expected revenue under reconstructed class three with three three five three zero and and then you had you have to make a decision for yourself is that 40 cents or 37 cents higher uh coverage is that worth additional six cents or whatever the difference in premium there is um and everybody will come up with a different answer to that question but just keep in mind that the basis is going to be virtually identical and you are setting a higher um a revenue floor um with the um 30 cents higher revenue floor with the synthetic class three than than true class three here and again that's just pure noise in the market that we don't control um it's 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 priced in one way or another but uh it's um you you are setting a, a higher class three floor that way essentially those two endorsements are no matter what happens with the market these two endorsements three five three zero protein or three or class three they will pay almost to the penny the same amount of money if we uh almost to the penny the same amount of money if we if we drop for example cheese from dollar six to dollar two Take a look. Uh, actually, components pay just a little bit more, 50 cents more in this case. And gross indemnity. Yeah, okay. because it has just a, just a bit more protein than uh, than class three. Okay. But thanks, anyway, thanks, Marvin. Yeah, so that's a, that's that's a trick that that uh, I actually only learned that recently. Somebody pointed out to me. Okay. Um, a question came in. Most of the the discussion around dairy risk management. Uh, revolves around milk pricing and uh, locking in or hedging milk prices. Should dairy producers be looking to do anything on the feed side of their um, of their balance of their expense uh, expenses? Greg, you want to take that one first? Sure, I'll take a first swing at that. Um, here, here's how I've advised most of my clients. First of all, understand that uh, your income over feed cost is partially driven by your forage costs. So when it comes down to your actual feed risk, once your forage is in the bunk, that risk is in my in my book gone. So the actual feed cost risk is much smaller than what we generally think about it from an academic basis. Now again, if you've already bought your dry shell corn, it's in a bin or you grew it, uh, you may have other portions of your feed already um, already locked in regardless of risk management it's already done because it's in the bin so i think it it's very situationally specific question i can't say this farm should you know should be risking or uh, hedging feed and this farm you know this farm might need it and this farm might not so it's situationally dependent um i tend to be uh to defer those discussions for somebody to talk with their nutritionist look for opportunities and do it as almost a completely separate exercise from the milk and i and i am not hung up i i'll probably eat these words i will probably eat these words within the next 12 months i hope i don't but i have rarely seen a business jeopardized by high feed costs yes it happened in 2012 yes that's those were purchase feed operations buying a lot of forage but most of my clients grow a lot of their forage a little bit of their corn and almost nobody's business is jeopardized because of feed cost but i've seen businesses jeopardized by milk dozens of times okay yeah i, I, I would uh, be on the same page as, as greg on this one um you know just keep in mind dmc is not your feed uh lgm is not your feed uh for some of the ingredients that you use in the feed ration you may have the opportunity to lock in the price for for you know a few months out or maybe a year year or longer out depending on 
it depends on what you use and what you buy. Um, if you if you hedged milk all the way, uh, and uh, you know, and you have a good opportunity to to hedge feed, that's not something that that should be easily dismissed. I would put it that that way. Uh, certainly, what you don't want to see happen. Probably the worst case, case scenario is that you forward contract milk, so you 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 remove all the upside on the milk, and you don't hedge feed. And then if the feed goes through the roof, and the, and the spot a spot milk goes through the roof, and you're stuck with your ceiling on milk because you forward contracted, then you're then you're in dire straits. Um, but with DRP, you you set the floor on milk, you keep all the upside. So presumably, if the feed prices go up, milk prices will go up as well. So um, you know, that's you have a little bit of a natural hedge there. And I'll just respond to that too. That I, I agree that the concept of locking a margin is a forward contracting, in my opinion, is a forward contracting concept. So now that we're dealing with milk price floors, I think we can independently view the feed hedge as a separate decision. Okay. Another question that that came in is. Um, I think this is probably from Aaron. Can you explain how to get a PF of 1.5? Is that through a combination of DRP? Uh, PF stands for protection factor. Uh, so uh, it, okay, so here's the deal with that. Let's say that you will make uh, 15 million pounds of milk per quarter. I know that's, that's too much for some of the listeners, but just for the sake of the argument, uh, uh, so that we can nicely round it. So you can do it in two different ways. You can do 15 million pounds, my screen is still being shared, right? Um, yes, yes. I just need to wait uh, for audience to hear. So you, you can either do 15 million pounds with protection factor of one, you, you'll pay, let's move it to dollars. Uh, let's say that it's class three, you'll pay $43,000. And, or you can do 10 million pounds. So a third more, a third less with 1.5 protection factor, you can pay exactly to the penny the same, the indemnities will be the same, everything will be the same. What's the difference? If you're gonna make 15 million pounds a quarter, in the first case, when you when you declare 15 and use one zero, you used up all your bullets. When you declare 10 and use 1.5, and then you know we have something crazy happens and class three goes to 20 bucks, you still have that five million that you can lock in at a higher price. Yeah, you'll be a little bit overhedged, but it's all within the rules, and your overall uh, uh, expected revenue floor will rise on your portfolio. So that's why I say, what, whatever you want to do with one zero, you can do, do exactly the same with one five protection factor. Just drop your pounds by a third and, and save. Say, you know, keep your powder dry so you can pull the trigger. Um, you know, if there is an opportunity for for that, you know, final one-third opportunistic hedging. Yeah, and I'm going to just react to that too, that I think that's a, that's, this is a very good learning experience for me, and I know a lot of people are learning from that, Marin. And now that we're dealing with some, some base changes uh, in, in the industry right now, co-ops saying you can't, we're not going to pay over this amount, what we're seeing play out is when you did, took down that DRP contract, it's still working out well because if you hedged 100%, and I've got a, and I, and I've now I'm, I'm that 15% milk, let's say on one co-op, you know, they want me to maybe they, they're not going to pay me as much over 85%. If I decide to reduce my production, I'm still safe at the moment. At the moment, I'm still safe because I, I have to produce up to 85% of that milk to, to, to get full payout under DRP. So I'm still safe. But here's a way that if that base changes further in different co-ops around the country at maybe different scenarios, maybe we can protect milk and not worry about what I can produce under base in this changing economy by using this 1.5 factor. Okay, thanks. Um, question from Marin. Um, this is a little bit of a, of a long one, but I'll do my best here. Um, with the with the first quarter indemnities announced, the yield adjustment factor had a big impact on the indemnity dollar amount, depending on what state you're in. Um, so, basically, um, I assume you know what what I'm talking about here. Yeah, yeah. Um, basically, how can producers better manage cash flow projections when the when the price floor projected and ultimately the revenue that can be uh, insured is altered so much potentially by that yield adjustment? 
Um, and is there any chance that that adjustment piece might get revised to help manage revenue better? Okay, so um, let's let's start with it. I'm going to speak very frank here. I hope I don't get into hot water. Um, without the yield factor, we wouldn't have 44% subsidy. Uh, so so the ERP is designed the way it is um, because that allows us to give you the best deal you know that we can given the existing infrastructure from the government. And let me let me keep it like that so that I don't create a sound bite. I regret later. Um, the the second part is that uh, my hope is that within 12 months from now I'll have some good news for you. But uh, it's very early on, and and I, I I I can't really reveal more. But I am keenly interested in removing as much uncertainty as I possibly can um, regarding your uh, risk management strategy. So so uh, be on a lookout for some news, hopefully March or April next year on on uh, on that front um my third point is that yield adjustment factor really uh irritates the most when indemnities are small because if indemnities are you know to the tune of 15 20 30 cents a hundred then if we are off with our yield forecast by one or two percent that that can decimate indemnities by 50 or 60 percent but for q2 for example if we have indemnities projected to the tune of five or six dollars per hundred weight yield adjustment factor will still going to you know reduce it maybe or increase it by 10 15 20 cents so as a percentage of total indemnity in a really dramatic crisis it, it's not going to be as big of a deal um you know uh, for q2 uh, than it was for q1 um it you know add to that that we really don't know what's going to happen with yields uh some people say well people will feed their cows differently uh, to reduce milk per cow production which will benefit your indemnities through DRP. Others say that lower producing cows, less producing cows will be uh, removed from the herd uh, more aggressively, which may increase the yield. Um, I, I, I don't know how feasible that is. I mean, um, slaughterhouses are, are, are really busy these days and, and under a lot of pressure. Um, one thing that I also have on my agenda is to talk with NAS um, to emphasize and emphasize to, again to them that them being wrong about milk cows and then revising them a month later um, higher so that the yield is revised to be lower that that's damaging to the industry it didn't used to be the case i mean those numbers were always kind of interesting people would be curious about them but you know it's it's good for government work, as the as the, as the going says. You know, so uh, but nowadays when we have a literally 1.1 billion dollars as of yesterday in projected payments for for calendar year 2020, it matters a lot that they don't screw up the the cow numbers um, and then revise them a, a month later in a way that would increase indemnities. So I'll talk with them to make sure that they they understand that error in one direction and error in the other direction are not symmetric. When it comes to uh, when it comes to indemnities, um, I'll do my best. You know, that's that's as much as I can say about this. I, I know it's a problem. There is limited amount of things that I can do short term, but I'm thinking very intensively. I would say agonizing over it almost daily and trying to figure out something that's legal that doesn't jeopardize the um, political support for DRP. We cannot make it a price product. You know, we'll we'll get we'll get killed if we make it a price product um and uh but there might be something that we may be able to do but more on that in six to nine months it it takes a lot of time to to bring these things to market so okay um i have a question next for tristan um and you may have to unmute yourself tristan um but uh basically this stuff can be really complicated and uh correct me if i'm wrong here but the the crop growers you and the other crop grower staff are happy to walk producers through some of these things and um our drp tool which is very powerful but um may take a little bit of uh learning curve to, to get going on uh you're happy to explain these things to producers uh correct <clears throat> yep good question chris so that's that's what we're here for we're here to have those conversations of the basis analysis we have this uh wonderful tool that producers can see right here in front of them right now 
uh, developed by Marin himself to have these discussions with producers to make sure that they, they understand the program. Our, our goal, obviously right now we can't do it, but our goal is to sit down at the table, um, go through your milk checks, go help you go through your business to understand where the risk is in that. Um, you know, just to, to clarify a comment that Mar Marin had earlier about the commissions, we are, as the, the crop growers team, we are non-commissioned agents. Um, our focus is to develop plans that has the, the grower's best interest in mind. So, you know, definitely reach out to those growers, reach out or reach out to your agents, excuse me, reach out to your agents, have those conversations with them so they can they can help you better understand the options and, and better uh, understand how to utilize some of these tools to protect your business. Yeah, yeah, my, okay, my apologies. Uh, think... Just to issue a public apology on that, I, I, I'd love to be a little dramatic uh, I was always afraid that I'll put people to sleep, so I, I use colorful language. Uh, my point is that producers should never feel shy or as if they're bothering anyone. If they if they call call five times a day, call ten times a week, you know, we are here for you. We'll get it done. You know, we we are here to serve you. Okay, yeah, because I, I think for some producers, I think the complexity of all of this is a, is a deterrent to participation for some people, and I, I want to make sure we can get past that. Um, so it's it's uh, it's now approaching quarter past. Um, so we're a little bit over time. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get to every question that came in. We will have to follow up with a few people individually. Um, Tristan, do you have any um, kind of wrap up thoughts that you want to share? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say you know thank you for everyone that took the time to join the call today. Uh, thank you to Crop Growers and the Farm Credit East team for hosting this event for us. Uh, special thanks to our speakers, Greg and Marin, for taking the time uh, to educate us on what I think is a really timely topic. Um, we've seen a lot of volatility in the market, uh, and I think this this came in handy um, to help us determine what, what steps we take moving forward. Uh, and then just one last thing as a reminder, the webinar you know was recorded and will be posted to the Farm Credit East website, um, which you, I see you've got up right there, Chris. So. Um, that's that's all I have. Okay, thank you very much. And with that, we're adjourned. Um, and I uh, thank you all for your time today.